now introduce Jennifer Plitt. Jennifer is the director of the Newcastle Historical Society, and I am so pleased that she has been a co-sponsor of this program. Thanks, Jennifer. Oh, thank you so much, Joan. Um, again, my name is uh, Jennifer Blick. I'm the director of the Newcastle Historical Society um, in Chappaqua, New York. Um, and just a very brief bit about the Newcastle Historical Society. Um, we are a local historical society um, founded in 1966. And our main mission is to collect, preserve, and to educate the public on the history of the town of Newcastle. For those that might not be um, familiar with the town of Newcastle, um, it does actually have two other two hamlets, uh, the hamlet of Chappaqua um, and also Millwood. So those two areas are within the confines of the town of Newcastle. Um, the Historical Society is headquartered at the historic Horace Greeley House um, right on King Street in downtown Chappaqua. Um, and again, for those that may not be familiar with Horace Greeley, um, he was a noted 19th century uh, newspaper editor, um, one of the most famous newspaper editors of his time, um, and his home in Chappaqua served as his uh, country residence, essentially, for him and his family um, for, for the period of the 1860s up until his death until 1872. Um, so that is where we're headquartered. We do provide the public with research, um, also educational programs, um, both for virtual and also in person. We are, have just been starting to uh, migrate back to some um, uh, in-person programming um, that we will be taking a look at our uh, these new, unfortunately, uh, variants come across uh, as to whether how we will be continuing with that uh, over the course of, of the winter. Um, but please um, visit our website uh, to find out more about our programs um, and educational offerings. Um, and again, thank you to Joan Kuhn and the Chappaqua Library for um, uh, bringing this to our attention and, and inviting us to uh, co-sponsor uh, this great opportunity for those within Westchester and possibly outside of the Westchester area to learn a little bit more about um, the importance of Westchester County um, and our local sites to the Revolutionary War uh, period um, from starting in 1776. Um, I will now actually be um, looking and um, uh, introducing our guest speaker um, to uh, our program today. Uh, Constance Kehoe, um, and also joining us uh, will be Mark Cheshire, um, who is also um, on the board of uh, Revolutionary Westchester 250 or RW250. Mark, um, in his other job, serves as the historian for the village of Croton um, and also serves on the board of the Odell House Rochambeau headquarters. So Mark will also be helping out uh, curating some of the Q&A uh, questions that come across um, and possibly also um, answering some other questions um, if we get them throughout the course of our talk. Um, our speaker for today, though, um, is Constance Keo, and uh, she is um, president of Revolutionary Westchester 250. Um, Constance is a 1969 graduate of Vassar College and received a master's in teaching degree from Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Um, from an early age, she lived in South Bend, Indiana from fourth grade through 12th grade where a high school social studies teacher sparked her love of all things historic and her college major was no surprise history. I do have to interrupt and say very similar, um, my path as well, um, a very, um, engaging social studies teacher sparked my interest in history. So just shows you how education um, and uh, engaging teachers really do make an impression on students at a young age. Um, she had retired from her own educational sales and consulting business, Literacy Warehouse in 2007, um, after a stimulating 20 year career, um, and also began a career in public service when in 2009, she was first selected as a village trustee in Irvington, New York, um, and also served as a deputy mayor for Irvington. Um, her ter terms um, have just recently ended, I believe at the end of uh, 2021. Um, and just a little bit about um, RW250, or again, Revolutionary Westchester 250. Um, I think the RW250 is a slightly shorter way of, uh, of saying it, but um, the mission of RW250 is to, uh, to really build awareness um, and excitement um, for the events and places and the people um, throughout Westchester County 
um, really that made an impact, those that names we may know and those who may not be known um, or little known sites or sites that we have not really um, maybe formally recognized or remember um, from years ago. So um, without further ado, I wanna turn everything over to our speaker for today, Constance, um, who will be um, enlightening all of us a little bit about uh, the history of uh, Westchester's place in Revolutionary War history. Constance. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that lovely introduction and for Joan and Mark for being part of this day. And really for all of you, uh, I, I'm thrilled that there is such interest in this history. Um, so I, um, I know that you will communicate with Mark and Jennifer and Joan. I, I won't look at the questions and I won't look at the chat, but uh, they will inform me if there's some issue that uh, I need to know about immediately. So um, I'm am conscious of the time. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. There's so many people to thank and so many things that I could start with, but um, we will have time at the end for, for a lot of that as well. So um, the Revolutionary War in Westchester County, I mean, you're all familiar with that date, 1776, of course, uh, but I just wanted to make it clear that Westchester County, New York experienced this war this war of independence all the way through to 1783. So just that just gives you a little sense that um, a lot happened here in those almost eight years. Now this little schema, um, these stars were uh, something that um, I started with my colleagues when we first got into looking at this history. And we started saying, well, where are the places that something happened in our county here in New York? So it was evolving and evolving. And the last time I looked at our list, it was 53 places. <laughs> now, don't panic. We're not going to try to do 53 places today. But um, I do have um, an intention of covering about 23 of them. Um, and I'll apologize right now for leaving out so many really interesting places that tell a story a little known or, or better known. So uh, this certainly isn't the only time we're ever going to give a talk about this because with the kind of interest that I see uh, today, I think we'll be um, having a, a whole lot of other talks as the next four and a half years go by. So let me give you a better um, map here. Um, I'm, I'm really thankful to our friends in the East Chester Historical Society um, who've been involved often and they uh, lent me this uh, schema, which is helpful. Uh, so some of you may not be totally familiar with where Westchester County, New York is but this should help. Um, below that dotted line at the bottom of this map is um, New York City. Um, the left part, of course, is Manhattan. You also see uh, parts of the Bronx, which just as an aside, at the time of the revolution, the Bronx was part of Westchester County. Um, you see the very important Hudson River now to Washington and to, uh, I would say most people um, in 1776, the Hudson River was known to be an important and strategic part of what was gonna happen with this, with this war. Um, up above, off the map, off the top, you come to West Point and other points north. You see Long Island Sound and you see Connecticut on the right. And um, I'm not gonna go through all the parts of this map, but here's what I'll say just to orient us. Um, you see the term neutral ground um, written across Westchester. Now, that's important to know, but it's an, also important to Think about neutral, not as a safe and wonderful place where there was no war. 
Um, I think in some ways you might want to call it no man's land or um, a lawless place or a place where skirmishes and raids and attacks on all the citizens who lived here happened uh, because neither side was totally in control here. If you were a loyalist and you lived here, you might um, move down to New York City where the British were controlled. Um, if you were wealthy enough, you might go to Great Britain or you might go to, to Canada. If you supported the Patriots, uh, the Continentals, the new nation, uh, Washington's army, you might we very well travel above that line, that uh, red dotted line and go north. Um, I also marked the Croton River. Um, I'm glad Mark is with us here because he knows a lot about the Croton River and the village of Croton. That's only the small part of the Croton River. It continues and meanders along. But because I mentioned it a few times, I thought it was good to have a little orientation with this. So um, you'll know that this place was important and it was a dangerous place for the people that lived here, including the enslaved. I think you probably know there was still um, slavery uh, in New York during this period until 1827, long after the revolution. So that's a little uh, orientation for what we're going to do. Uh, this orientation um, is a little bit chronological. So everybody's familiar, as I said, with the year 1776, um, Declaration of Independence and a crucial battle. I'm saying this um, as what is uh, the primary um, parts of what I'm gonna talk about during this one year. It's not the only thing, but um, you probably have in your head what that crucial battle might be, 1776. All right, let's take a look. Declaration of Independence. Ah, this, I love this. This is a, this is a copy of the broadsides that, uh, and there are a few copies that still exist today of this, um, these, these printed pieces of paper. And I bring it up with the date July 9th as a good place to start our trip through places. Um, July 9th um, is not July 4th because, well, July 4th, you know, that's the story in Philadelphia. The Declaration of Independence is being written um, in Philadelphia but it's sent up to White Plains to a group of important uh, individuals who are meeting in White Plains and they're called the Fourth Provincial Congress of New York. They are given the task of saying uh, yay or nay, uh, does New York support this declaration? Um, and in fact, the answer is yes, they, they do support the declaration. And uh, that makes the vote in Philadelphia uh, unanimous. All the 13 quote colonies uh, vote in favor of the declaration. So keeping it as a New York story, this is um, uh, an enlargement of the top of that broadside. And I just, um, well, it made me feel really um, almost emotional to think about what it was like for the people who were reading this for the first time at that year and that summer of July, July 9th, the summer of 76. Here's seeing the state of New York for the very first time. Um, and what would that have looked like? Let's imagine it like an artist did. Uh, sorry, let's go back. So um, in the early 20th century, this is one of the paintings that um, 
depict what the imaginary scene was, uh, we do know a little bit from historical documents. We do know that Judge uh, John Thomas from Purchase is the person who read the declaration aloud in White Plains. And um, I can't imagine it really looked like this, but it, it, it gives us a, a little bit of a sense. Um, now, what can you see? A lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is really, is there any place that people can go today to actually be in a place where some of this history happened? So yes, you can. Um, this is in White Plains. This is a plaza in front of what is now called the Armory Building. And you can find this in White Plains and stand on the, the building isn't public, but, um, and it's no longer the Armory, but it's, uh, it is a place that you can stand and see this um, eagle and a recognition of the place where that declaration was read in New York State for the first time. Uh, and for those of you who want to think ahead, will we ever be able to stand there and reenact this? Maybe, maybe, 2026. <laughs> All right, I mentioned a major um, crucial battle and I'm, um, I know there wasn't photography in 1776, but this is a reenactment of the Battle of White Plains um, that happened um, in late October of 1776. This reenactment was in Ward Pound Ridge Reservation in 2001. And I'll get back to a, you know, a very quick view of of things that you can see related to the Battle of White Plains. But first, um, I want to mention on the right here, um, something that isn't in White Plains, but you'll see the connection in a second. This is the St. Paul's Church, our only national historic site in Westchester County. And it's in more of the southern part of Westchester, so down closer to New York City. Um, I want you to picture that church um, in 1776 with only part of those walls built up, no roof, um, no cemetery. And imagine um, that it, um, well, you can't imagine this exactly, but let me show you a map for a second. Um, the British invade uh, Westchester before they, uh, before the Battle of White Plains, just a short time before the Battle of White Plains, the invasion comes um, at a place called Pell's Point, which is not in the Hudson. It's, this is on the opposite side. This is um, what you might call Long Island Sound. And the British invasion happens there. And it's about a mile from that church that I just showed you. Um, and that is the place, if you are going to a place to really experience that um, feel for the Battle of Pell's Point, going to that St. Paul's will give you that, as well as there are some other places that you can go. Um, now, <laughs> I visited, um, Pelham Bay Park. And for those who really know the history, um, you'll know that the actual point here in that's marked as Glover's Rock is not an accurate place where the battle actually happened. But because it's a public place and it's a good place to find out something about Colonel Glover, very important guy uh, who was um, a uh, officer in Washington's army. He did some really valuable things here, which would be about an hour's talk. But I will say that um, the it's the golf course nearby. Split Rock Golf Course is where you can um, learn about the more about this Battle of Pell's Point and uh, the folks from St. Paul's are the ones who can tell you a lot about that. 
So I'm going to jump now to a week or so after this invasion where um, I would say the best way to describe it is Colonel Glover slowed down um, and gave Washington some time to get his army up to White Plains. And here we are in White Plains in the midst of that battle. <laughs> well, shall we say this is again one of those um, early 20th century paintings to help you imagine what happened. So the Patriots, uh, Washington is getting some of his regiments on top of Chatterton's Hill to defend it in White Plains. What you see in this painting, um, on the left, you see a river. Uh, that's the Bronx River. You see some very, very tiny red, cro red coated soldiers. And you can imagine what's about to happen here, right? So Washington's um, army is situated on the top of Chatterton Hill, a key place in White Plains, and they are attacked. And after several tries, uh, the British do overwhelm them. And uh, you could say, all right, that's Washington's defeat, right? Well, it's a more complicated picture. Uh, what a lot of historians and military strategists will say is that, yes, there was a, a defeat, but in, at an, in another way of looking at it, Washington's army was not annihilated. They uh, were able to retreat and fight another day. And so, uh, that if they were fighting uh, the greatest uh, military force at the time. So that they were orderly, they could orderly retreat was pretty important. So what can you see in White Plains today? Well, there is a Battle Hill Park on top of Chatterton Hill. That's one thing you can visit. Um, I think Jennifer lives right near there. So Jennifer is maybe our, our expert on uh, Battle Hill Park. I've certainly been there. Um, and she knows, and others who are locals know, there are two really wonderful buildings that you can visit uh, that give you uh, quite a feel for what it was like during the Battle of White Plains. This is the Purdy House. People here are, I'm not sure if I'm in that picture, but I've been there many times, um, uh, as has Mark, and I'm sure Jennifer has too. This is uh, a ceremony they, they hold uh, frequently. It's the White Plains Historical Society, actually. Um, and they give you a sense about what happened during the Battle of White Plains. This is another beautiful shot of that lovely old farmhouse. I know people who live in White Plains over many years probably know this building was actually moved from one part to another. This is the interior, well, well fixed up, beautiful, beautiful place to visit. Ah, and here is the second really critical place to visit in White Plains. This is the Miller House. The Miller House um, also played an important role during the Battle of White Plains. And there is a visitor center there. I'll show you an internal spot of the in, an inside picture of the, the uh, restored Miller house. It, it, it was in great disrepair and it is now thanks to the County of Westchester and George Latimer's uh, leadership, it's now restored, uh, fixed up. And after COVID, shall I say, will be a great place for a lot of programming and events. But I did say that, um, Washington could retreat. I'm going to show you where he retreated to. But I will also mention that there are lots of maps and, and tours. I've seen one with about 15 places in White Plains to drive around and visit. And we just can't have a focus on all of them right now. All right. 
And this is where uh, Washington managed to carefully uh, move his army uh, to cross the Hudson. You see the name Verplank's Point. It's also called King's Ferry. The Hudson is not very wide here. Um, and Stony Point is on the other side, and then you would be down moving through New Jersey. So let's see what it looks like now. This is in the town of Cortland. It's uh, certainly open to the public. It happens to be one of my favorite places in Westchester to get a feel for this part of history. That's the Hudson. Um, informational panels. Um, you can sometimes look up and see eagles up nearby. So it's, it's, a, it's a good place for contemplation and I hope some of you are managing to go there. I'm gonna take a quick um, check to make sure my uh, audio is fine. Can I see some heads shaking? Yes, okay, good. I'm gonna assume it's okay unless I, here differently. All right, proceeding on. <laughs> All right, that was 1776. Uh, but I did say at the beginning when I showed you that map that, um, that, that, that we, we sometimes call Westchester the neutral ground, but I made the point that it for the people that lived there, they didn't feel it was a wonderful, safe, neutral place. Um, they knew that there could be raids, that their houses could be burned, that their cattle could be stolen, their families would have to hide. Um, this is, imagine eight years of that life for people that lived here. It was, um, it was an important strategic place and, uh, it just wasn't controlled by either side. So let's <clears throat> get a feel from a couple of places about what happened during those years. Um, up on the Croton River that I mentioned uh, earlier, this is the Van Cortland Manor House. Um, the Van Cortlands were a wealthy family. They lived in uh, this northern part of Westchester um, and they were for the most part, maybe not every member, but they were they were a patriot family. They um, however, suffered in that there were, a number of uh, violent raids against this place um, and it was ransacked and it was still a dangerous place for them. So um, although I said if you were in northern Westchester and you were generally a patriot, you would um, still be in danger. So um, I pair that with a second manor house. This is the Phillips family manor house. So we've got two, um, two areas of Westchester that were controlled by two very powerful families. This one is in Yonkers. This is the state historic site Phillips Manor Hall. Um, it's in downtown Yonkers. It is near the... Um, Sawmill River, it's near the Hudson River. And it's um, in a, a very different place because of its placement in Southern New Jersey. I'm um, excuse me, <laughs> wow, so, Southern Westchester County, sorry that. And here are the two um, um, families that I mentioned. Frederick Phillips III was at the time of the revolution, the head of that family, he declared his loyalty to the king. He signed a, a declaration of dependence. And as a result, he uh, was forced to leave 
his manor house. He went to first to New York City where the British were. He went to Great Britain. Um, his property, his uh, 52,000 acres was confiscated by the new government. And uh, we'll hear a little bit about what happened with the land that was confiscated. Uh, Pierre's Van Cortland and the rest of that family, obviously their territory was not confiscated. They were, shall we say, on the winning side and they played an important role in the government, the new New York state government. And uh, many things could be said about both of these families, but that's for another day. Um, we've now mentioned the two sites that you can visit uh, the manor, the two manor houses, um, and they have different stories uh, as they pertain to the revolution. All right. So I did mention that there were raids and destruction and uh, skirmishes and attacks. Well, this is the village of Bedford. Bedford, New York. And Bedford um, had a regiment of uh, the Continental Army. They had a militia unit of the Patriots. And the British sent um, what was a somewhat notorious, uh, well, became notorious, Bannister Tarleton. Um, and he raided this village in um, and he was followed by another raid about a week later. And the end result of this for those residents, those civilians who lived there was the entire village of Bedford was burned. Now, one house was left. It was the house of a loyalist. Uh, so in Bedford, um, many years, not every year, they recreate that experience on the Bedford Green. And I would certainly recommend going to Bedford. The other uh, town that suffered nearby was Pound Ridge. Both of them uh, suffered because they were a Patriot stronghold and the British uh, made a point of coming up there uh, to punish them and to uh, attack the, those villages. I did want to calm it down a little bit by showing you a beautiful uh, Bedford oak, which is 500 years old. Um, so it obviously wasn't burned down. Now, this is a Don Troiani painting. Uh, Joan was mentioning Don Troiani, the artist at the beginning of this before we actually started. Um, now, maybe you can guess, but um, if you look in the back corner, you'll see the Hudson River. Uh, some of you know what the Hudson looks at various points in Westchester. You look across and you see the Palisades. So where you are here is Hastings, New York, Hastings on Hudson. Um, now, I said there was only one big conventional battle. Um, this encounter in Hastings involved 500 soldiers, which seems like more than a skirmish to me. Uh, but what happened here, and it turned out very well for Washington's um, Continental Army because they were able to ambush a group of um, soldiers, Hessian auxiliary troops of the British Army. The Hessians came up from the south um, to Hastings, which is on the Hudson River. Um, and they were on a, essentially on a foraging party. Now, I love that word foraging. It just, it implies so much, but just keep in mind, there were cattle, there were hogs, there was wheat. There were all kinds of supplies that the British with their army in New York City desperately needed. Um, the people who lived here desperately needed those food supplies and so did the Continental Army. So when you hear about cattle stealing and foraging, 
just imagine that this is really a big part of how the war continued. Uh, armies need to eat. Um, so how did this turn out? None of the patriots were killed and quite a few of the, um, the Hessians were. Uh, I draw attention to this particular raid. There are others that I could have uh, reviewed from that happened in Westchester, but there is some, uh, there's a public place for you to visit now to get a lot of great information. Um, just this fall, this uh, group of uh, local uh, citizens in uh, Hastings put together um, research and um, effort and landscaping to create uh, what they're calling the revolutionary walk. And this is one scene of those informational panels that are there now. And this is a close up of one of them. Uh, what I really like about the way this uh, new uh, visitors uh, plaza is, is that the quality of this information on these uh, panels is so uh, well done. It's it's visually interesting. It's the, the the research is accurate, and I think it it will add to uh, the kinds of places that, as you want to get a feel for what happened above and beyond the big battles of White Plains, what else happened and what was it like. Um, so, I hope to go there. <sighs> yes, another. This is another volunteer effort, and it's an incredibly evocative sculpture. I was there the day that it was uh, unveiled and talked to the, the creator of this. About 10 years of voluntary effort uh, created this. And what does it represent? Uh, there's so much to say about this. Obviously, we're doing like an inch deep on all these. We're not not even an inch. We're doing a quarter of an inch uh, rather than a whole treatise on each one of these places. Uh, I hope you go here. It's in Yorktown Heights, a place called Railroad Park. And what it's depicting is what is called the Battle of Pines Bridge. Uh, this again involves the Croton River. Um, the, the Rhode Island Regiment had a headquarters right by there. They were uh, protecting raids from the British, uh, but um, a, a notorious group called Delancey's Refugees, and they were loyalists. Um, who supported the British, they managed to get across the Croton River and surprise this regiment at their headquarters. So you see Colonel Green on the right, um, who was killed, if I got this all correct, somebody will correct us in, in the Q&A if I've said this slightly wrong, but um, the regiment is, is really interesting because the recruitment in Rhode Island um, was primarily um, men of African descent as well as indigenous people, men who were recruited in Rhode Island to serve in this regiment and they fought together. Um, and you'll see them again because they also were at the Battle of Yorktown, uh, Virginia, which ended the, 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 the war essentially. So I hope that you are able to visit this in um, Yorktown Heights. Ah, uh, yes, and there are many people, fine people to meet, reenactors. Um, this is uh, Dwayne Jackson. If he's here on us with us today, that's great. Um, you can learn a lot from the reenactors who wear the uniforms and can talk to uh, school kids uh, in living history. Uh, approach. Um, here we are in Chappaqua, and this is Jennifer will know this place. The Newcastle Historical Society knows uh, this, this historic building very well. It's a Quaker meeting house. 
And I mention it here because when I said the war came to everybody in Westchester, the Quakers were intent to not be involved in the war by their religious beliefs. They did not want to take human life. But uh, this lovely building, which was um, there in, it, during the war, did actually serve as a hospital for some of the wounded soldiers from the Battle of White Plains, actually. And there is a lovely uh, graveyard uh, behind this building. And it's a very evocative site. And it makes you think about how people who don't want to be involved in war they couldn't escape. There was there was a lot that uh, pulled them in and caused great problems. Okay, uh, I'm going to jump into a popular chapter of history here that unfolded in Westchester. This is the traitor, the spy, and the captors. Um, this is a, a, a chapter of history that you might now be able to recognize uh, the famous traitor uh, that's part of American Revolutionary War history. You know the name Benedict Arnold. The spy I'll talk about and the captors. Uh, they're my favorites in this whole uh, part of history. It did unfold mostly in Westchester County and I'll be showing you one uh, site in Westchester in Terrytown that you could definitely visit and I hope you do. But to give you the short, uh, and oh, I will say that the Revolutionary Westchester Subcommittee is very active in trying to mark places to see. And that is the, the group we call This Man's a Spy. <laughs> So I take you north of Westchester to West Point. I guess I guess that's about 15 miles north of Westchester on the Hudson River that you would call Hudson. It's called here the North River, which was a common name for it. Um, and uh, West Point, Washington knew uh, the the Continental Congress knew, everybody knew that it was important to hold on to West Point uh, during the conflict with the British because if the British were to take control of the entire um, Hudson River, uh, that would create um, a, a weakness of the, the Northern colonies, or colonies now states, and the, and the uh, the other colonies, and that it, it was critically important, is my summary, that we keep this uh, fort. But who was the general in charge of that fort in 1780? Uh, well, on the right, you see Benedict Arnold. Uh, he was uh, the general in charge of West Point. He was, again, this is an hours long talk, which we're not going to do today, but he was, um, maybe the best way to describe it, it was very disillusioned and unhappy and resentful towards the Continental Congress and towards Washington um, at this point in the war. And he made the decision uh, to commit treason. And the treasonous act was to give up the plans to the fort that he was the general of to the British. So he colluded with the spy, Major Andre, who was a British spy. And the story unfolded um, many twists and turns that uh, uh, we want to research every single part of this because there's a lot of myth and story that is developed. Um, and as a history major, I like to I like to look at the original sources and try to separate myth from what we can find out as good historians. So, um, a little of the story. Uh, this is Andre was an artist, um, and he. You know, spoiler alert, he is 
hanged as a spy before long, but he did draw before that a, a little drawing of what happened to him after he came up the Hudson on, a, on the frigate, uh, the British ship called the Vulture. He was rowed off the Vulture to meet with Benedict Arnold, and he did. And uh, I have an imaginary uh, drawing of what it might have looked like at the point when Benedict Arnold, who's sitting there with the papers in his hand, the papers that are telling um, the British about how to uh, attack and take over West Point. He's pointing to the boot, uh, I guess, the idea is that Arnold should put those in his boot or in his stocking. He has civilian clothes and um, he is going to make his way back to New York City and deliver those documents. Uh, as it turned out, he can't get back on the vulture and travel safely on that ship. Why not? Because the Patriots have shot at the, the ship with a cannon and with other um, small arms fire and that ship has pulled anchor and gone. So he is stranded now. He's in, he's near West Point um, and he has to get back to New York City. So where does he have to travel through? You guessed it, Westchester County. So let's see what happens. Well, Benedict Arnold gives him a pass. They, he thinks this will help. And uh, it says he has a pass to go to White Plains. And then he's a businessman, et cetera, et cetera. But here come my favorite um, players in this story. And that is the three militiamen um, Holding Van Wart and Williams. They are um, on a mission from their um, unit, from their commander. Uh, they've been issued their, uh, their muskets and they are to be on the lookout for cattle thieves. And they are part of a larger unit who are at other places looking for cattle thieves. But they are near Terrytown, and along comes the spy, Major Andre. Uh, much can be told here in a longer version, but I will just say that they um, become suspicious of him. He offers them a bribe, but they refuse. They, uh, they go as far as to um, find the papers in his boot, actually in his stocking. And they are aware of what uh, seems to be true uh, because John Paulding can read and the other two can't. So he's able to look at those documents and get a good feel about what um, is going on, and he is then delivered by these militiamen to their commanding officer. Uh, as it happens, uh, Benedict Arnold gets away to Great Britain, but Andre, as I said, is hanged as a spy in Japan. Now, quickly forwarding, where can, oh yes, this is one of the sheets that <laughs> were in his boot in his stocking. And it's, you know, again, if this were a longer talk about just this section of our history, we could talk more about what um, they, what, what Benedict Arnold was revealing with all, you know, how many people were in Colonel Lamb's regiment and where were they? So at the top, you see Andre's burial place at Tapan, but my, my focus is on, uh, Terrytown and what you can visit in Terrytown. And that is, um, well, there's a lot to say about this, but what I find really um, fascinating is 
how as the years go by, how the, the militiamen are honored. Uh, initially, of course, they got praise from Washington. They got, there were medals offered. There were um, uh, pensions given and land that they could have. Uh, and um, a, a monument was built, but then exactly a hundred years after the capture, Oops, how do we get? Um, I just want to um, see if you can imagine being here in Terrytown in 1880. I find this amazing. Um, in 1880, a hundred years after the capture, 70,000 people came to see this new statue with John Paulding and to honor that day in history. Now, you can too, you can go to Patriots Park too. <laughs> uh, in Patriots Park in Terrytown, um, you see this sign, you see the park, you see the statue. And I just um, warn you not to say that, or ask for where is the, where is the statue to Andre? Because it is not a statue to honor Andre. It is a statue to honor the militiamen who may have changed the course of history by interrupting that traitorous act and that plan getting to the British, which didn't happen because of their quick thinking um, and the action they took in Terrytown. So uh, I don't know how our time is going, but I'm gonna quickly try to go through a very important chapter under told uh, about how we had the French nation as our allies during the war of our independence. Um, this is only 1781 and 1782. So you know, we're almost at the end because 1783 is the end of the war. So. A quick uh, run through about our alliance with the French and how it is part of Westchester County's history. Uh, the general in charge of the French army was the Comte de Rochambeau. And he had landed about, I guess, a year earlier in uh, Rhode Island. And at this point in the war, he is encamped with his, I'm going to say, uh, somebody's going to correct me, about uh, 5,000 French troops. In Washington, you see Washington's headquarters also on this map, right above the big word of Phillipsburg. Um, Washington's headquarters, as it happens, there's nothing left to see. It's near Ardsley High School, for those of you who know the county. Uh, but Rochambeau's house, there is something to see, and we will be talking about that structure in just a moment. Here you see some of the encampment of the troops in an old map. And this is another French map that I find interesting because they had different places in Westchester. They were encamped um, at Bedford and elsewhere. And you also see that King's Ferry is gonna be part of this story yet again. That's for Planks Point, King's Ferry, we talked about before. So again, paintings can help us imagine what might have happened. Um, so let's imagine we're inside Rochambeau's headquarters and it's right there on Ridge Road in Hartsdale. Um, on the left, uh, the Comte de Rochambeau, on the right, Washington, in between, they are discussing how they will um, manage to defeat their common enemy, the British. And you see, if you can see well that um, map, it says Chesapeake Bay. Well, you might be thinking, why aren't they going to attack the British right there in New York City? It's a few miles away. But by various reasons that, um, again, are probably three books worth of uh, data that people have and analysis, what, 
what we know is that the decision probably made right here in Westchester um, was that the final battle these allies will fight will be in Yorktown, Virginia. Uh, now, this is going to be a long process. And this is after reconnaissance and analysis and understanding of where the French fleet was at the time. But just imagine um, Westchester, again, playing such an important role in having an alliance with the French and having these two generals um, really work together uh, with great respect for each other. So what happened? Well, oh yes, we have to see the Rochambeau headquarters. So as I understand it, this uh, is really from about 1910. Um, I guess none of you were around in 1910, but here is what you can see today. Um, it's not open to the public yet. It's under reconstruction, thankfully. Um, and the Friends of Rochambeau, Odell House Rochambeau headquarters are critical to this, uh, as well as the town of Greenberg. But what I'm seeing here is that, again, it's a way to know that Westchester played an important, whoops, played an important role and there are still places that are existing for us to visit. Around Westchester, there are various of these plaques. I think this one is in Dobbs Ferry um, and it shows the map of the march to victory or the march to um, uh, Yorktown, Virginia. But here's a better uh, picture of that map. It's important that it it didn't all start in Westchester because Rochambeau came from Newport, which you see at the top right of that map. But they all, the two armies crossed at um, Verplank's Point, along with the oxen and the horse and the artillery pieces, all crossed, went down to Yorktown, victorious, and then those armies came back again. And believe it or not, they came back to Verplank's point in 1782. So um, I use this example here uh, to show you. Um, a painting that a, a general in the French army made and uh, he was representing the the army that he admired of Washington um, that had originally been kind of called a ragtag group, but he found them a very effective fighting group. And I, I find it um, important that he included the Rhode Island representative of the Rhode Island regiment uh, that I mentioned before as the individual depicted on the left. So they come back, the armies come back to Verplank, and this is a wonderful place near to Verplank's point. Um, it's the old St. Peter's Church, Van Cortmanville, and uh, there are some of those French soldiers who gave their lives here, and they are buried here, and they are ceremonies that are held periodically, I think every summer. Um, and it, it recognizes that alliance. It's a great place to visit. And when you go to Verplank's Point, you can see a copy of this famous painting. Uh, this is a John Tur Tur Trumbull painting, and I like the close-up. Now, why do I like that close-up? <laughs> because it's there that you see the Hudson River and the encampment uh, at Verplank's Point. Um, I'm hoping my time is still going okay. Okay, this is um, this is the a painting of that um, actual um, encampment at Verplank, and it's a great find for historians. I won't say too much about it here. I'll just give you a close up of these so that historians have a 
real view of what that, it's in the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia now, but it's our Burp Lang's point. <laughs> okay. There was no um, peace treaty until um, after that encampment. Washington is actually now up in Newburgh, New York, uh, north of here. He doesn't know that there's really uh, the end of the war. So John Jay, uh, a Westchester guy, <laughs> uh, grew up in Westchester. And uh, this is his homestead uh, where he, this is the John Jay Homestead. State Historic Site, Katona, New York, uh, which was his retirement home. And there's another place in Westchester where he grew up, the Jay Heritage Center. Um, so much should be said today about John Jay, uh, but all I'll say is these are great places to visit. Um, he was the crucial person, one of the crucial people um, who um, affected that peace treaty in Paris that ended the war. And now Washington um, knows the war is over and we can finally have evacuation day. Evacuation day means the British evacuate New York City and Washington has to move from Newburgh to New York City. What does he have to go through to get there? Westchester. So again, we have to imagine what it was like. Washington comes into New York City. He goes to Francis Tavern um, and there's a great dinner for him. And later he says goodbye to his officers. You can certainly go there. I have, I bet a number of you, if you were putting up your virtual hands would say, yes, I've been there. Um, but it does remind me that I left out all the taverns in Westchester and many of them I'm still leaving out, but um, taverns were really important in the history of the revolution. The Square House in Rye, a great place to visit. The Jug Tavern in Ossining, another lovely place. And um, the war is over. And what happens to the confiscated land of the loyalists? Well, uh, Thomas Paine, who did so much for the Patriots, is rewarded uh, with a cottage and about 200 acres of land in New Rochelle. So that again is a lovely place to visit. How's my time? Uh, it is what time right now? How much time has passed? Uh, all right, so <laughs> I know I've gone way You're fine. Far. Don't worry. Okay, Joan says, don't worry. Uh, I can show you quickly about five slides or so of what we are doing with Revolutionary Westchester. Uh, here we are in Yonkers. Here we are in Kings Ferry, Burke Plank. Here we are at St. Paul's. Um, in Hastings and in St. Paul's. Our, we've made videos of sites. We used to have lectures before the pandemic. This is in the Irvington Library. We've done some printing of materials. We have a YouTube channel. We've got some book groups. We've got another one coming up on the right, Valiant Ambition, mm -hmm. hope you join us. We're in Hastings and oh yes, okay. The last two slides, my hope for the future of historic awareness, kids, high school kids, young kids, get them interested, hook them into history. And I think we'll have preservation and commemorations and an understanding of history if we get the next generation. That's it, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was amazing. We had a huge audience and um, thank you, Constance. Thank you so much. This was a fabulous program. I was fascinated. I was so close to my screen most of the time mm -hmm. just to see some of the information. So um, do you wanna say any parting words, Jennifer or Mark, before we go? Um, I will just say, you know, again, thank you, Constance um, and Mark for your work, putting all of this together and really um, making a very informative uh, talk for everybody about 
the importance of Westchester and as to why we're, we're sort of focusing on this, the, the Westchester 250, um, if people didn't know this or had uh, do their quick math, um, we are working our way up to the 250th anniversary uh, of the American Revolution 1776, that will be 2026. So this is why this particular group is now really getting together, um, has been for the last um, several years, and Constance, you can um, correct me um, on the exact dates, um, to really bring awareness to Westchester's key role um, in the American Revolution and also really, I think, just highlighting um, how dangerous a place this actually was for those, you know, residents who were left here. And then um, just one of the things I always like to, um, you know, tell everyone about or have people think about was the fact that a lot of families, you know, were still here where, you know, men were going off to either fight for either the Patriot cause or the British cause, whichever side that they were on, that left a lot of the women here in Westchester, you know, basically managing their households, managing their farms. So women really took an active role um, in day-to-day -day life. And really, um, I think as, as we look at more of the, the history of that, the, their role um, and their knowledge and their background really kept a lot of uh, this area you know, running and, and functioning. Um, and just one other quick thing, just to note, um, as you were highlighting some of um, particularly Major Andre's um, escape um, and, and the letters that were, were found in his boot, um, the Clements, I guess the Clements Library at the University of Michigan actually has um, some of the original coded letters that were going back and forth between Benedict Arnold and Major Andre. Um, so they've obviously been decoded. So you can actually look those up online and actually see exactly what Benedict Arnold was negotiating for in terms of what he wanted um, for all of this. Um, and it was no small sum. <laughs> it, was, it was a tidy amount that he, that he was uh, hoping to get from all of this. So, but thank you both so much for your, for your work in, in highlighting this period. So. And Mark, do you have anything you wanna mention? Mm -hmm. No, just uh, thanks uh, everyone to coming and and uh, you know follow us on online. We uh, we're in the process of redoing our website, but you will find our website at uh, rw250.org, and we also have a very good uh, Facebook page. Uh, we're on Instagram, uh, and definitely check out our YouTube channel because we have a number of other uh, we have a number of videos uh, that uh, really talk about some of these uh, talk about some of these sites. So look for our, Thank our you. YouTube channel. Right, I appreciate Thank you. All, all your input and uh, bringing up the women. Deborah Sampson, I'm gonna do a talk uh, on, on her one day as mm -hmm. well as all the other women who uh, really kept uh, a, a lot going. So mm -hmm. I guess that's goodbye. Well, I just <laughs> wanna say before you go, uh, thank you all. But uh, this is just the beginning of our alliance. We will hope to bring you many more programs from RW250 and just look at uh, the Chappaqua Library website and you will see uh, the ongoing programs that we will co-sponsor with them. And of course, the Newcastle Historical Society. So thank all of you for coming and please visit uh, the Chappaqua Library website, which is chappaqualibrary.org. And thank you for all the people who sent me their emails and I will put you uh, to get Chappaqua Library upcoming programs and I will put you on our mailing list. So again, thank you, these wonderful, it was, this was a great alliance and this whole thing worked out beautifully. So uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all, I will end the meeting now. <laughs>